Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to this uh, special She Says Global event. Um, brands, brands blaming why marketing is still sexist and how to fix it. This is a special event for us and the very first of its um, kind because it's a live focus group because we have the authors of Brand Splaining with us, Philippa Roberts and Jane Cunningham. And um, Amy Dick will be um, moderating the panel discussion. Please, 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 if you have any questions, please add them to the chat. Um, if you, you know, and if you have, you know, any questions, just add them to the chat and we'll try and get to them um, later on. I'm sure Amy will. And um, yeah, welcome. And um, I'll hand you over to Amy. Hello. So I'm Amy Dick. Um, thank you for joining us. Um, so I'm an entrepreneur working at the intersection of technology, leadership and diversity. I'm also an executive producer and brand consultant working in the world of marketing. Now, I'm super excited that we have Philippa and Jane with us today, um, the authors, as Julian's explained, of brand Brandsplaining, um, why marketing is still sexist and how to fix it. Now, they've got years of experience working in marketing before deciding to dedicate their time to understand female um, audiences. And so uh, it makes sense for us to look a little bit more into the intersection of that to explore um, what, what it's like for women of colour and uh, marketing messages and how they land um, for, for us. So um, we have with us today three women at varying stages in their uh, lives. Uh, the first being Ella, who is um, a researcher and historian who looks into ethnicity, race and um, immigration in Britain. We have uh, Nadia, who is uh, a PR veteran and also a black mother with a capital B and M, as she will say for herself. And we have Rosa also, who is a carer. Hi, ladies. Um, shall we begin? <laughs> so um, I'd love for us to start with the early memories that you have of advertising messages um, that were presented to you, perhaps growing up, or those that really kind of resonated with you. If you can tell us what they were and how they really made you feel in terms of your sense of self, um, your idea of the world, perspective you gained of the world, um, and also your expectations for life. If we can start with Rosa. Uh... In my early years, uh, later 20s, I saw the first picture of uh, Naomi Campbell. And she was an inspiration for me because she was the first black woman appeared in Vogue magazine. And since that, I start thinking, uh, even though she's very, uh, she was younger than me and uh, I had this inspiration because she was young, she was black, she was born in Brixton and she was in a, uh, in a big magazine and it was an inspiration for me. Amazing. Yes. I think uh, that will resonate with a lot of us as well. <laughs> um, okay, uh, Nadia, should we hear from you? Yeah, um, so I actually have three images. I'll, I'll try and keep it as brief as I can. So the first one is, um, I don't know if any of you recognize this. I'm really showing my age by being this one. But it's the iconic Timothée adverts of the 80s and 90s. This, this slightly problematic sister right here, not her fault. Um, but I think there is so much in this image uh, I mean, I'm sure going to have a really interesting discussion about the gaze, um, but the gaze here is so evident and so apparent. Um, but this woman really influenced me when I was a little girl and she made me um, think I could do this a lot. She made me think I should be washing my hair more than once a week or once a month, as a lot of black girls do. And I felt that there was something wrong with my hair. Um, for that, I wanted to. Go, I would go to friends' sleepovers and start washing my hair there, and it was just a bit of a. Uh, yeah, it was. A, it ended up being a bit catastrophic, but yeah, I think she gave me um, a real false idea of what my hair should be like and what I should be like, and that's obviously a big, a big part because I'm a black woman. But I think for many women who are not black. Um, who are not of colour, um, it was 
probably very much the same thing. Um, then the next image I wanted to share with everyone that's really formative for me was um, Gem and the Holograms. Again, showing my age here, but um, Gem I thought was truly outrageous and truly inspiring. But what I loved about this, she was a cartoon character, by the way. So she had a, she was like a, a regular girl by day going to her high school and then by night she was in a band. They were like the Spice Girls before everyone knew, anyone of these Spice Girls were, were going to exist. And they were amazing. Amazing. And there was this one chick, Shana, you can see her there in the background, and she's not white. She's black. Well, she's latte, you know, she's she's kind of biscotti. She's got some colour on her, but that was unbelievably exciting for me. And I was like, yes, I feel seen. Um, and this was something I held on to, and there's a lot of good about it, but there was a lot that was wrong with it, because to me, I felt that I could be seen if I was somewhere in the background, if I was playing the backup singer or the backup um, musician. And I think that stayed with me for a long time. And I think that is something that I've seen an awful lot in my life and particularly my career because I work in the comms field and I see it in the room and I see that perception come through and that view come through that if you're not white, it's all right. If you're in the background if you are not the protagonist and if you're not the hero in the story um, and I had to really do a lot of work to unwind some of that idea of who I should be and where I should be um, but I don't want to take away from the fact that she did start to give me some some power and probably led me to the next image I really wanted to share with you which is from the I can't, oh it's a gift great I hope everyone can see that um, I don't know if any, again, show my age, I don't know if anyone remembers this, but this is actually a Lynx ad, so it's an ad for men, back in the 90s, I want to say, and there's an iconic Boom Shaka Wow Wow ad, uh, I'm not going to sing it, um, but this was a moment for me, I think I saw this when I was on holiday in the States with my family, and here you have this black woman, dark skin, natural hair, she is being sexy, she is being really goofy. She's trying to get the guy um, with real confidence and the guy's interested because he gives a kind of approving head nod at the end. But she just, there is so much confidence and sexuality. And again, she, compared to what I just showed you with Gem, she seemed like a real hero in her story. Um, and that, was, that showed me what was possible for a black woman in an image in the images we see in marketing so yeah those are the three for me thanks Nadia I would um, urge everyone to please google the ads because it's brilliant it'll make you happy today <laughs> um Ella it'd be great to hear from you too um yeah I'll definitely be googling that ad um yeah for me the most um memorable adverts growing up as a kid were the ones that were fun and unexpected and had a plot that thickened. So if you're from the UK and you're watching TV in the noughties, you've definitely seen this ad. Um, and if you haven't seen it, it's just, it's just like a gorilla looking very like pensive and thoughtful and composed, um, sat at a drum set. And then slowly he starts to fit in with, you know, that I can't remember the guy's name, but he's a singer from the eighties. Um, I can feel it. Call it. Yeah. In. yeah, that guy. Um, and yeah, I just love that as a kid. I was probably like six or so when this came out um, and that was really fun. Um, and then the other really memorable ad, if you go on to the next side, yeah, funnily enough, another um, Cadbury's advert and both these ads happened before Cadbury was bought by that American com trading company in 2010. So this is like, yeah, when Cadbury's was more fun. Um, and basically it's just like a giant head with loads of cocoa beans on him and he's just walking through a village in Ghana. You don't really know what's going on and then the music starts building and then he throws one of his cocoa beans off his head into the air. It explodes, it turns into Tinny who's like a Ghanaian artist. He lands on the roof um, above one of the shops. Everyone's just grooving, vibing and me and my brother used to get up and dance to it. Um, an impacting like sense of self. I'm I'm half Ghanaian and I'd never seen Ghana um, in the UK on the TV before. So I felt very proud. Um, yeah, and I, and I loved that ad as a kid, but it's funny looking back, um, 
I just googled the ad again like it's my first time watching it in over 10 years and they received loads of complaints for perpetuating colonial stereotypes um and obviously you're not thinking these things at that age um and you're just grooving away but I just think this speaks to the politics of representation and how lack of representation um leads to problems with you know, nuance and um, yeah, race, racism, wait, racism, because of racism, there was huge problems with representation with black people and there, there is no room for nuance. So if you do something like that, it's, it's okay, we're not represented on TV at all. And when you do represent us, you're representing us in a village. And that's, that's kind of where the problems lay. But as a kid, you're not thinking these things. And those were my two favorite ads because I would get up and groove. So yeah. <clears throat> Thank you for sharing that. And uh, yeah, it's it's super kind of interesting for us to kind of look at look with our child's mind's eye and be able to kind of retrospectively kind of observe actually what what did that really mean for us? Um, what does that really mean for us today? Um, speaking of today, then I'd love to hear from you guys on the marketing messages that you come across kind of day in day out and how how you feel they are affecting your sense of belonging and confidence and mindset and very much your well-being today. Um, shall we start with uh, Nadia this time? You're yeah, on mute myself. It's really helpful. <laughs> um, yeah, it's an interesting one for me, if I'm honest, because I'm kind of, I'm inside the machine, right? I'm not the bit of the machine that makes the ad, but I'm uh, I'm definitely a cog somewhere that sees the ad and I can see the decision making as it happens. And the thing that I guess gets me is kind of the, the cognitive dissonance in action. <laughs> Witnessing it is, is quite something um, and how that makes me feel therefore, because I, a lot of time I'm seeing this marketing being created and then I'm seeing it and if I'm honest a lot of the time I'm, I'm, I'm shaking my head or I've got my head in my hands or I'm face palming just something to do with the general signals of distress and the reason I say that is because I think a lot of um, marketeers um, a lot of brands think they get it and they really don't and that's fine but they don't get that they don't get it and that can be a real problem. Um, and I, and the way it makes me feel as someone who's sitting in those rooms and who is rarely shy to express my opinion is just a deep sense of, of absolute frustration because I'm literally sitting here, a black woman, giving you a point of view, both from my perspective, but from the perspective of a lot of women, because I am like, one of those women who believe that, you know, as a, as, as a black woman, what, what tends to benefit black women often tends to benefit everyone. And I believe in all women. I believe in all women be, feeling good. And that's why, you know, it's important for me to express my view when I'm in those situations, because I do think marketing has the power to make people feel good and see themselves in a positive way and not have self-esteem issues. So it can be really, really frustrating when you're, when you're seeing this happen and you're trying to voice that opinion and it's really not, not landing. And so the thing for me about advertising is that it, it, it talks an awful lot about wanting to do, to do good and that sort of thing. But for me, it just needs to do right. It just needs to do right by women. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I put this, this ad up by, by Venus um, because I, I, I think it's good. So right, Venus now has aspiration to be much more representative of all kinds of women, race, body shape, um, you know, postpartum, pregnant, all that sort of thing, which I think is really fantastic. But what really irritates me is just like, guys, you're, you're doing this because you acknowledge that a lot of women don't feel seen and because they don't feel seen, it can lead to, you know, the only word I can think of is trauma. You know, it, it can really affects their perception of themselves. And you've created this. Um, and it's great that you're trying to portray a different view of that now, but can you just for a second think about the fact that you're responsible for women feeling that way and that you're effectively trying to fix a problem that you've created? Um, and that's why I talk about the cognitive dissonance an awful lot. So I think it, 
it makes me feel frustrated. It makes me feel quite empowered in a lot of ways. Um, but I wish, I wish that advertising and marketing felt more empowered. You're right. I, felt, I, I wish that it felt empowered to do something with the responsibility that it had, that it has, um, and, and to acknowledge what, it, what it's done with that so far. Um, and instead of saying, oh, look, aren't we great? Aren't we fantastic? We can say, look, we are the ones that, that have kind of failed women in, in a way. You know, it's like, who created these standards, though? You're talking about, you know, going against these standards. Who created this? Anybody? <laughs> Anybody? Um, so, yeah. So, yeah, as the way it makes me feel is almost, as I said, I'm in, I'm in a unique position that I, I'm inside the, mach the machine is, you know, I, I kind of have to see it as some form of social justice um, because I, I think brands need to correct the way they've made an awful lot of, of women feel. Um, uh, did, did that answer your question, Amy? Yeah, it does. And I think you've just raised so many, I mean, I agree with everything you've said and you've raised some really kind of big um, and important points, especially just, you know, the trauma that carries on as well. And uh, yeah, this huge call to action that I love that you kind of presented um, that we, you know, because we many of us on, on this event today are, working in the industry and you know there is agency for us as well so uh we'll we'll come to discussing that a little bit more a bit later too uh thank you nadia um rosa it would be lovely to hear from you as well on that same question and by the way audience if if any thoughts come up whilst uh, we're chatting please use the chat function to just type it in there so that we can pick it up and uh, explore them towards the end over to you rosa uh, what I can say, uh, I think that for me, uh, we have a woman that uh, Kamala Harris, that is an example, um, is a, a, a woman of power, and she can show us that it doesn't matter which background you come, or which color you are, or even though you are a black woman, but because you are um, the vice president of uh, the United States, you can pass and you can change the world. Sometimes what we see in the, some advertising is the advertising is just for a certain kind of, of woman, beautiful, uh, slim, perfect. And women is not like that. We work with mind, now with the body. Oh, we have to pass the power. The Martin should pass a power, uh, encourage women. It doesn't matter the shape or the color, where or where you come from, but you are a woman and you can do anything. And sometimes it's our attitude as well that can work. Because if you put on your mind, I am a black woman, I can't speak uh, uh, very good uh, English or whatever. I can't do this, I can't do that. You will humiliate yourself and you will not be able to do anything in life because I can see so many women that they can be up there, but because the way they think, they can't do anything. and. Also, the marketing can traumatize them because the way they put things is just for a certain kind of woman. It doesn't matter if you are black, if you are white, you are talking about black uh, women, but it doesn't matter if you are black or white or whatever. You have to think, I am able to do it. And it doesn't matter how long it is going to take but I will do it and I am able to do it. Thank you, Rosa. And uh, yeah, it's a real reminder um, of, you know, even personally, I'm really grateful that we can find some powerful images like that cover that you just shared with us um, to help us kind of see what is possible in life. Ella, it'd be great to hear from you. You're on mute, there you go. Oh, sorry. Yeah, to answer this question, I'd say the last time I actually felt influenced by an ad, I was probably like 14 or 15. Um, and I feel like you're much more malleable at that age. You're finding your feet in the world. You're finding what you like and dislike. And back in those days, um, yeah, like boots obviously didn't cater for black women at all. 
and I'd go to the um yeah it's not supposed to be that yeah I'd go I'd go to the black hair shops with my mum and they weren't catering to my curl pattern um and then finally I saw this ad and I was like oh my god wow I can I finally found something that caters to me um um but nowadays not so much honestly I don't have a tv so I don't watch tv the only ads I get are on my phone and on my laptop and they're just through the algorithm and because they try to target, I'm not a paranoid person, but because they try to target you in a specific way and they think you've got, they've got you. And um, I think now like 70% of the ads I get a light skin or mixed race woman, which means nothing to me now, now that I found my hair product that works. So I kind of recoil and honestly, I don't think marketing and advertising has a strong impact on my sense of self today. Um, maybe I'll become more malleable again at some point, but nah, not now, no. <laughs> yeah. That response and yeah, hopefully you won't be malleable in, in the future. You know, I love that you've got this strength there and you kind of know who you are and you're able to just kind of, yeah, just do you. Um, next question I'd love to pose is um, just thinking around um, safety, I guess. How safe do we think marketing and advertising is for women of colour and we've sort of explored some of this but I'd like to kind of hear from you all oh, quite directly on this one and uh, we can start with Rosa. Yes, uh, like I said uh, Kamala Harris for me is a big big inspiration and Look that woman and the first of a black woman in the a, a, be a vice president. I feel safe. I feel if power, and she can be inspiration for any woman in the world. She can be, and even for me, even though I am uh, getting older now, but she is an inspiration inspiration for me. I think she's younger than me, but she is inspiration if, for me. And she can, uh, she pass, I feel safe. She passed me power. And even though in my age, sometimes I feel one day I will be someone like I in my country because I work in, I was born in Angola. I went to Portugal. I am here now. But I am working it, and one day, who knows where I will be. Thank you, Rosa. Ella, shall we hear from you? Sorry, I need to remember to unmute. Yeah, I think um, when Black people are chosen to be represented by the white mainstream, even in, sorry, in Black spaces too, it's a mess. It's just... Um, completely oversaturated by light skin and mixed race people. We're seen as like the palatable black, the bridge, um, kind of like a pawn in white complacency. Um, and the ad that you can see now perfectly summarizes that. It's a sheer moisture ad um, and their consumers, you know, that are black women. Yeah, the whole, the whole, the ad featured majority white women and a light skin or mixed woman. Um, and yeah, I just think marketers constantly shoot themselves in the foot when it comes to these things. This, this was very recently, this was only like a few years ago. Um, and I think in recent years, we are seeing more representation um, of cis black women, um, dark skinned black women, but not without backlash like last Christmas the Sainsbury's ad if, if you're in the UK I'm sure you heard about that they had a dark skin black family in the ad and the UK lost their um, <laughs> um they, they received loads of complaints um and as a result Tesco pulled the only two um dark skin people in their ad that they had so no we've got a long way to go and that's not even touching on um, other marginalized genders too. Um, yeah, I think that sums up, so that's really cynical, but yeah, honestly, um, 
that's what I think yeah, yeah. it was it was honest and uh yeah I agree I agree with that Nadia it'd be great to hear from you um, yeah, I mean, I'm going to be cynical too, girl. I mean, <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm cynical when it comes to like the industry, but I'm optimistic when I think about women. Um, yeah, I mean, I just want to build on Ella's point here, like the, the, the palatable representation of, of black women. Yeah, like I said, I'm, I'm in the room sometimes and this is being talked about and I'll be sat right there in a room full of marketing people often for female centric products and brands, often it's an all female team. And the things that I hear such as, you know, should we think about not having a blonde woman in this advert? What if we got a woman who wasn't even white? And they go, okay, yeah, let's do it. But we can't get like a black woman, an actual black, I mean, th this is being said in front of me. And what they're saying is they can't have a dark skinned black woman or woman who, who is clearly, you know, racially, you know, racially mixed. You know, they wanted someone who was, who is um, racially ambiguous, um, and but I mean that's the 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 the, the beauty, those beautiful words aren't reserved for people who are uh, look like me. I've heard really offensive comments about Jewish people. I had one client say, "We cannot have women with noses like that." Um, you know, they 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 look too Jewish. People will never buy our products. I've heard a client again, a woman. I've heard clients say things like, "You know, let's not talk about mental health because it's just for sad people, I and mean, we want happy people buying products." So no, it doesn't feel like a safe space. It feels like a jungle where you're going to get jumped by a million animals. Having said that, I chose this ad because, like I said, I am an optimist at heart, and I feel like the you know the, the mainstream is what is is what isn't safe. But I think the mainstream, you know, at the margins, you find beauty, and I feel more and more women are so literate when it comes to that, they know that they're not necessarily going to get the best image of themselves reflected back at them if they look to the mainstream and they look elsewhere. Uh, because, you know, the mainstream wants you to think that, you know, you're lacking something, that's how you'll buy something, right? Um, but this image to me is amazing because she has, you know, a black, black, black hairstyle. She is just like, she, I feel someone just took a snapshot of her chatting with her with her girls. And I just, you know, everyone knows Michaela Cole and everyone raves about her. She's a real media darling, media darling, right? I don't know how many brands would actually be brave enough to put her in an ad and certainly to put her in an ad like, like this, because to me that hasn't, it has such an energy about it. It has such a realness about it. Um, it has a supreme sense of agency that, that really makes me tingle. Um, I feel like she just turned up being herself and feeling herself and, you know, everything around her, you know, the production team just kind of fell in line and, and you know, and she didn't have to ask them to do that. And I feel like every ad can and should make women feel that way. And I love that this exists because it tells me that it's possible. So I think if these people who think they know everything <laughs> would just accept that they don't and look to this stuff and understand how it makes women feel, it would be a much safer landscape for, for every woman of every class, creed, color, gender. Love it. Um, and yeah, absolutely. Look into the margins, definitely. Um, this is such a powerful image. And actually that's this, my next question is, for you guys to share an image that really gives you power. Um, if we start with Ella on this one. Yeah, um, I think the ads that I've seen that have given me power are not, ref not necessarily ones that fit my phenotype to speak in like biologically racist kind of terms, but just one, of people just being like in their essence, just doing their thing. And the ad that I thought, it wasn't actually this ad, the ad that I thought of, I couldn't get a screenshot for it, was just the, the Nike London ad that they did a few years ago. And that was the rare times that I thought it showed the London that I knew and they got it right. Um, and I think, yeah, there is a lot of pressure and responsibility when it comes to representation because of everything's mediated through racism and the patriarchy and that lead as a result of that that leads to getting it wrong by it's, it's difficult to explain but I think for me the best ads are the ones that um don't tamper with individuality 
and allow people in their essence um, doing their thing. And, and we see it as nuance, but it's not nuance, it's just reality. Mm. Um, yeah, and I do think Nike get it right a lot. And um, they did do an ad with Serena Williams that I liked. Um, so yeah, that's why I chose that photo. Yeah. <laughs> thank you thank you what an amazing um answer there and uh, yeah i love that nugget at the end um around just kind of just letting people just be themselves and that's basically a, it's as simple as that um rosa what would your powerful image be uh, uh for me is when uh they advertising something that appears so many people, it doesn't matter uh, the age, uh, all together uh, laughing and uh, playing. This give me power. It doesn't matter if it's a young uh, uh, girl or old, or, but they are together and they look happy and uh, is like the all this changing is not about a blonde person or a black uh, um, darker person no it's about everyone and every woman the same mm -hmm. different age but look that's they look happy is this is the power for me thank you difference togetherness and uh, smiles happiness um, Nadia? Um, I, I think, so we talk about media images broadly and um, I, I, I regress an awful lot um, and just get lost in TikTok. <laughs> because to me it is, it, it's just an incredible place um, and a place I wish was around when I was, you know, in my, in my formative years because the level of fearlessness that you find there from young people in particular but from many people the things that the topics people talk about and the way in which they talk about them with not a hint of um e ego um, I mean people actively they go out of their way to embrace discomfort and I think that is something that is essential if we are going to rewire this system better people need to get better with talking about and confronting the things that we don't do well as a society and we don't do well individually so i feel like TikTok is something that everyone should just lose several hours on um not too much because it's really bad for your eyes um and um yeah it's, it's just it's a really amazing way to think about things because i think it will naturally change your approach to things if you go down the right wormholes and then this campaign this is the next client of mine I didn't specifically work on this campaign but I I, I, took, I have really mixed feelings about it because I think there's Pantene is like a, this huge mega brand right that wants you to um, like Timote and um, so I have mixed feelings about it but I do think I, I, I like that I, and a lot of brands are talking about trans rights and trans women and featuring trans women in their advertising because it's hip to and it's being talked about and it's mainstream. But I do think the way they did it is quite sensitive. I think um, the way they did it was not that tokenistic. I think it was very authentic because, you know, they're talking about the power of hair. I think the power of hair for someone who is a trans woman or man, or just for everyone, it's important, right? But specifically for trans women, I think was really, it, it is very unique. And I think, you know, for me, this is, I talk about marketing that does the right thing. Um, you know, trans women are killed at an alarming rate. It's literally a matter of life and death for them to be humanized. And marketing has an opportunity and a responsibility to humanize people and to think about in very specific terms about who needs it the most. That's why I said, I really believe in the, in the equity part of the diversity, equity and inclusion. So I like that they did this and I like that it was big and I want more brands to do that. I want more brands to think of like, if how will we a matter of life and death and how can we be like the police basically? Um, and then there was another image I had, which was, um, again, this is a, a trans woman. And yeah, I'm like, I think it's important to keep talking about that and centering women who look like this and who are like this you know she's a trans woman she is you know fat 
I think the marketing industry talks about being diverse and I, I work with I have worked with a lot of beauty brands and I'm still shocked at the lack of body diversity um again we talked about dark skin black women and I like this was Calvin Klein and I, you know the whole campaign was a bit tokenistic but I, I'm like I kind of don't care she's a fat dark skin black trans woman I love that you've sent her to your advertising now please go and send to her in that in that decision making room right just send to her in your factory send to her in your supply chain send to her and at every point where you can and should so um that's why i like this amazing amazing thank you oh yes oh. and the, oh sorry <laughs> can i just talk I'll, I'll just say about that last one i talk about it all the time it's any peng black girls i'll drop the link in the in the chat if anyone hasn't seen it but for me that was just like i'm like I feel seen, man. I keep trying to pitch this to a particular client, but it's just a love letter to dark skinned black women. And again, I wish I'd seen it. I cried the first time I watched it. It's amazing. Um, this is the kind of media we need more of. And every single type of woman needs this. I saw in the chat, someone talking about South Asian women. Yes, it's absolutely shocking, shocking the lack of representation of, of South Asian women. I feel like they're very silenced by the majority and you see that in marketing and marketing can do has every opportunity to address that it's good commercial sense and again it's the right thing to do so yeah i hope every woman gets a paying back girls thank you that was really all of it was just fantastic and super super insightful we'd love to turn now to jane and philippa to hear from you guys um so the question i have really and i think uh our, our women have actually started kind of offering their own solutions what frameworks do you feel need to be in place to make marketing and advertising safer and safe for for women of color and for diverse marginalized groups generally oh god honestly i found that so fascinating Amazing. all of that it's really a so a so insightful and so kind of beautifully um expressed by all of you um i suppose and this is the point that you ha you have all all made is that the, the sort of first place to start is around awareness and being really conscious of the biases that are there in the system and Nadia you said it beautifully when you said we need to rewire the system and that is the first thing that that needs to happen in order to create a more positive and progressive context for the development of, of marketing and in the, the first part of our book we, we um, look quite really closely at what we call the factory settings of marketing which are these you know those really those base level um, assumptions upon which marketing was originally founded and which it which continue to sort of play this often invisible hand in the way things get communicated and the way audiences get seen and the way markets get segmented and one of the sort of central themes that we discuss and you've you've um, all three of you discussed it in different ways is this notion of the the good girl which comes from a place when a sort of well it's an age-old discourse isn't it when men held most of the power and most of the privilege and women were therefore under um, a cultural um, cultural pressure to behave in ways that were pleasing to men and whatever the progress there has been for women today that it's still the case that it's mostly men who are mostly in charge most of the time and women are still under this cultural pressure therefore to behave in ways that are agreeable to men and that male pleasing ideal and marketing has been very, very responsible for perpetuating and painting that good girl ideal and playing out and making it writ large in, in full um, technicolor. And the truth is, is that is an immensely, uh, the, you know, the good girl has got immensely narrow definitions, even now, the good girl has to look a certain way, which invariably is thin, slim, young, white, or fair, as it's euphemistically referred to often, and pleasing. And the per her personality has to be passive, agreeable, 
uh, on receive, often vacant and gullible. And the roles that she plays are these, these backing roles, support roles, um, backing singer kind of, uh, of roles. And in communication still, all that discourse is, is playing out. And as you've all rightly said, anyone who's outside that narrow definition uh, is women of color, women who are low affluent, old women are excluded from that, from, from that, um, from that discourse. So being very aware that that archetype is so dominant and still dominates and still leaks out is the sort of one of the first ways I think of, of trying to rewire the system because the system is based on that, on that archetype. And from a sort of research point of view, from a methodological point of view, I guess, what we're always very conscious of is, you know, when you're constructing samples, when you're doing research, it's really important and it does happen quite a lot where the, the sort of sample or the construct of the research um, really prioritizes the good girl in terms of who gets spoken to, who gets recruited and certainly who gets listened to and heard in a research group. So, you know, we quite often do research groups. We've got women in a group like you guys. We're behind this, this sort of clients behind the mirror. One of us normally sits with the clients while one does the research group. And it's amazing just how um, people will self-select to listen to people who look like them. And invariably, the people who are in marketing are younger or whiter, um, are middle class, and therefore overhear the voices of the people who they feel are, are like them. And so it's really important in sample constructs to ensure that there is proper representation within the people that you're speaking to. And in, in quantitative research, ensuring that the sample sizes are big enough so you don't just have, you know, a very small sample size of women who sit outside of that kind of uh, idealized notion of what good women look like. And that includes older women, as Phil says, and also women in lower socioeconomic groups who are often completely ignored in research. And of course, women of color. So those sort of the, the, the groups that get marginalized need to be considered much more carefully um, and need to be brought into the conversation. Then once they're in the conversation, they really need to get listened to. <laughs> And there's so much bias in, the, in that hearing and what gets heard and what gets prioritised and what people are interested in. Mm -hmm. um, and until, of course, the representation within marketing shifts and changes, that's always going to have to be a very conscious effort on people's behalf. And it, it shouldn't need to be. It should be, of course, there should, of course, be proper rep representation and therefore not that, that not necessarily needed. And it's also important, very technical point, but for any of you who are interested in research that looking at the people who are recruiting for your research, you know, check out the recruiters, you know, if they're all white, you're quite likely to get an overrepresentation of white people in the groups too. So, you know, because they will recruit in their likeness too. So it's massively important that you pay attention to who's doing the recruiting. Um, yeah. Thank you. Um, so just thinking of, because we all, most of us in one way or another are working within the industry. So what, are, what would you say in terms of how we can have some of these difficult conversations at the right times in real time when we're spotting these problematic kind of systemic issues coming up and they're, they're playing out right in our faces. Um, but considering, you know, people sit at various different levels of political hierarchy. So it can be difficult to kind of speak up at the right time. Yeah. What, what's your advice around that? How can we have these conversations? And well, we, we think that, um, that the, one of the very helpful things always is to have a very clear understanding of, of who the audience is and bringing, trying to bring the discourse back all the time to the audience so that the, it's, it's not a, I said you said type of a discourse but it's saying that these are this is our audience this is what they're like this is what they like and if they're kept in mind throughout the process and it's a proper deep um, textual understanding of the audience you know to use Ella's brilliant, ex brilliant expression don't tamper with the mm. individuality it's a great expression perfect but, think, but having that 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 really textured understanding of who an audience is not in the, in a sort of pen portrait 
shallow archetype, you know, 2D thing, but proper lived experience of the audience and having that always as the sort of touchstone in development, going from right from the beginning of the development strategy all the way through to the execution, constantly being able to reference back to that is, is a, a, I guess, a less, perhaps a less loaded or less heated way of, of keeping the keeping things on track. I mean, I, I'm interested, Nadja, you, 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 the examples you were giving, I mean, sound, I mean, they sound, it was basically just sort of full, full on racism, the sort of discussions that you were describing. Um, you know, in cases like that, you, I mean, you, I, what I want to say is call it out, you know, step into the breach, call it out, but clearly that's not always possible to do, or is it? You, t you tell me. I mean, the, the, the restraint it, it requires is, <clears throat> is, is jaw dropping. Yeah, you've got to call them out. You've got to kind of embarrass them in a way that doesn't hurt their pride and that gets them to do the right thing in the end, right? Because yeah. they need to think it was, you know, the the, the genesis of this great idea yeah. of this, you know, not being offensive, you know, it was, it was them. Um, so you, yeah, to me, like I just want them to do the right thing. You know, they 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 pay me to tell them to do the right thing, and then I have to tell them to do the, the, the thing that I know is is right given my lived experience. And and yeah. what I think a lot of people would say is the right thing. So I think you've got to call them out. I, I tend to try and call them out without embarrassing them. So in the case of and, and it pains me to say this because I'm, I'm a bit embarrassed as well so in the case of the the the, the talent that I recommended was Haim they were the ones that the client said they looked too Jewish um, right and I had to say look they're number one in all these countries yeah I mean, amazing it's not an talent. issue for most people they're happy to buy their records so maybe they'd be happy to buy a shampoo so that that sort of gets them thinking and I'm and I'm yeah. sort of in my head I'm like this should embarrass you but I don't know if it does <laughs> it's really it's it's so annoying to have to sort of be so um so nice about it isn't it but i think we find the same thing you know certainly in all of the since we wrote our first book all of the conversations that we've had to have with um companies have been quite tricky at times you know and i guess like you quite often what we resort to is saying well have a look at these brands that are really you know that women really connect with and look at the way that they do it you know and quite often those brands are brands that are made by women they're direct to consumer brands so they're the brands that have basically cut through the sort of patriarchy of the of the of the retailer and have um and have sort of connected with women very deeply so brands like third love or um even brands like glossier or 13 loon now is really interesting beauty bakery you know there's so many of these brands that women conceived of and brought to market um without the sort of editorial control i guess of of men which is where a lot of the sort of traditional brands have been really um and we thought we found that really helpful because again i guess it's the sort of third party principle it's not about me versus you or my opinion and your opinion it's sort of going around the issue to say um well you might not think women like that kind of thing or that's going to work but hey what about glossier what about bumble what about these brands that have just bitten a massive chunk out of the traditional brands operating in those markets because they're you know they're they're not adhering and conforming to the sort of classic male ideal of what women should be like what women should be interested in so yeah, we find that helpful. But of course, what you really want to say is, you know, come on, this is just, you know, you're just in the dark ages, you know, it's crazy. And I've got a little saying I quite like, which is, you've got to be the case study before you're taken seriously. That's just yeah. how it is. Yeah. Yeah. And I suppose it's also, I mean, this is quite, again, quite an sort of easy thing to say and not necessarily at all an easy thing to do, but recognising that being difficult or the, diff the notion of difficulty, uh, difficult conversation, is, is that's part of the good girl discourse and conditioning. And dis being difficult is not a bad thing, is it? Being, you know, it's, it's the good girl discourse that tells us we're being disagreeable or disobedient, or it's wrong to be, to object. And, you know, men can object to things all the time and they never get the same thing about oh they're being difficult if they stand up for stand up for something so the, yes the, the whole idea of being a difficult woman or a difficult subject just means doesn't it just means it's a really big 
important, complicated thing to wrestle with, but is worth wrestling with. Absolutely, definitely. Um, we have nine minutes left. I'm thinking, shall we open the floor up to uh, yeah. audience questions that might be coming up? Um, just see if there are any here. Yeah, I, I've got one um, from Amy. I'm starting from the bottom up because there's so many comments. So, but it seems here there's a question from Amy um, and it is, how do we make sure brand products, services, et cetera, that truly serve and understand women designed and created by women for women actually get the investment and get out there? Well, that, I mean, that is something, I mean, that that's something that is changing. I mean, there it, it's, it, it, there's, there's been a huge drive actually since International Women's Day this this year really for in it for for helping women get funding in a way that they haven't. I think it's only two point seven percent of funding yeah. go, goes to women. Yeah. yeah, and and black women. I think it's zero point zero two percent of funding goes to goes to companies started by by women of color. So it's tiny um, percentage. But I think just knowing that and that actually that figure has just kind of surfaced time and time again. Um, and is, I think, having a having a huge um, it, well, there's a huge story around it in the business press, which is encouraging VCs to look again at how they can change that, and also an input, a, a sort of a, a proper drive to recruit women into VCs. Um, but the way, the best way to do it is to buy products, um, buy products that are bought, you know, that are made by women, and and show and show your sort of solidarity with those brands because the bigger they get the more popular they become um, the more likely it is that um that they're going to attract the investment that they deserve but it's a it, i mean it's a it's a proper problem and it's genuinely you know genuinely you know and it must there must be endemic sexism in the process otherwise the figures couldn't be so dismal and and certainly there's there's racism in there too there's the sort of it's the intersection of all kinds of things if if you're over 50 virtually impossible to get funding from anybody um as a woman so um yeah it's a bad situation but the best thing you can do is just keep buying those products yeah. and talking about them bigging them up, talking to, you know, talking to your friends about them, ensuring that you, you know, when you're being interviewed, if you're being interviewed in the business press, you discuss them, you talk about them, you make the most of them. To borrow um, Nadia's uh, phrasing, you know, look to the margins, right? And mm. kind of invest in that. Yeah, absolutely. Good question. Okay, just following up from that, there's a comment from Prudence just saying, Fixing sexism in advertising shouldn't be left just to women, though. She's pleased to see a couple few men on the on this call as well, but would love yeah. to see more. We would love to see more. Yeah, so absolutely. shout out to the guys who are here. Thank you. Um, just more. Should I keep going with comments, Amy? You... Uh, yeah. If there are any questions, yeah. if not. Maybe yeah. Yeah. They're, they're... Ah, here we go. Opal. So here's a long one here. So, but regardless of whether you know and on paper understand the audience is not, it is still not fairly, and the audience isn't, is it not still this fairly dysfunctional? Let me start again. But regardless of whether you know and on paper understand the audience, is it still not fairly dysfunctional if no one representing that experience is actually in the creative production decision-making room and decision-making room? That's one. Does it not further dehumanize marginalized groups in the way you win over people is with facts, figures, stats, and not with lived experiences and trust in those who lived ex with lived experience? Or I guess it is just a bad situation, pretty bad, but the best possible solution in the short term. Did everyone get that? Yes, I agree, well, agree, agree, agree. Agree yeah. with all of it, definitely. Yeah. Mm. It, it would be much better if you didn't have to defer to secondhand experience and stats. It would be much better if the people in the room represented the audience. Mm. Without a doubt. Mm. There, without a doubt. And, yeah, if, if I may, I think that the, the point that you make there about having to, I don't know if you're referring to what I was saying about having to say to a client, like, you know, you're going to make money. I think, unfortunately, the gatekeepers are not who many of us on this call today would want them to be. 
you know, that's that's not the makeup. And until that changes, and there are things going on that, you know, I am seeing more people in the in the production suites and seeing more black copywriters. They're amazing. There's amazing talent coming up in the industry. And that's going to pay off. Like in five, 10 years time, we're going to see a, sh a, sh a shift in the makeup of the gatekeepers. But until then, the current gate gatekeepers, the only color they understand is green. You know, it's the money. You've got to speak to them in the language they understand if you want to you know, paint the world your colours. And it's kind of painful that you've got to do that sometimes. That's why I said, I'm, it's embarrassing for me because yeah. I just want to say, you're a bigot, <laughs> but yeah. I can't say that. Um, and I can't let you put that horrible offensive advert out in the world. I can't let you put that worldview out in the world in, in some, through some form of communication, which some woman's going to see. So I have to use any means necessary to stop you doing that. So if I need to speak, speak to your sense of, to your business acumen, I'm going to do that. But yeah, hopefully there'll come a time where they will just believe you when you say that, um, yeah. Opal, I completely agree with you. Um, there are just more comments here, um, Amy. So um, Lindsay says, yes, getting past the gatekeepers is important right now. Um, John Sharp, John, hi, John. Thanks for joining. I found it easier to call out and put people together, um, put together representative teams as a consultant. A agency structure, pressures on cost, time are broken. I think I did hear, uh, and um, that's, that's a really it. good point around, yeah. um, you know, business models changing and, you know, the agency structures are, for, you know, being forced to kind of rethink how they organize themselves. So actually, yes, I think that really does give an opportunity for doing things the right way. Um, I think that's a really great point, John. Mm. And Michelle, are there any resources you recommend to help spread understanding of these issues? Mm, that's a good question. Um, I mean, I think I think it's uh, issues around, I mean, if it's awareness, I think it's really kind of plugging into kind of what's going on culturally and, you know, sharing that and talking about that and uh, just immersing yourself. Um, I definitely say that. Um, I'm not sure if you're kind of coming at that question from another angle. I'm not sure if I've answered it. Um, but otherwise also, I think, you know, if, if it's uh, getting the right people in the room or getting the right partners involved in your projects, it's doing the research and reaching out to networks who can connect you a lot quicker um, to the right people is also going to be super helpful. Um, not sure if anyone else has some suggestions there to add. Google's amazing. There's lots of stuff on Google. Just Google. <laughs> yeah. And there are lots of books as well, aren't there? And do more stuff like this. I mean, this has been so brilliant, hasn't it? With and got a guy, you know, heard so many really helpful perspectives and things like this happening is a brilliant way of creating change and, and discussion around it. Definitely. I, I think we're at time, um, Gillian, is that right? Yeah, um, we are. Um, everybody, if you wouldn't mind unmuting yourselves and giving everybody a round of applause please we've got philippa amy <laughs> nadia rosa ella <laughs> jane thank you so much Bravo. thank that's... you for having us thank you yeah. so much thank, thank you. you happy thank to you. meet you all it's it's been great um i don't know if ali's still around if um if Joyce wants to say anything, but um, thank you so much. I think it's been a success. Everyone's saying thank you. It's been amazing and um, great discussion. Everyone's saying amazing job. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thanks for the session. It's been great, really insightful. So yeah, it's it's been amazing. Um, thank you, ladies. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks it. for having us. Yeah. Thank you, thank you so much for everyone uh, for joining. It was it's really really good, and I really enjoyed. Um, listening to everyone and, and hearing about your your views on, on things and it's been really really good learning curve as well uh, I think so thank you. Fab. Thanks, awesome thank you ladies it's been great <laughs>